Hey, my name is Abe. This is BibleCraft, where we help you study the Bible for yourself. And today we're looking at the inductive Bible study method. This is a method that does not begin with the conclusions in mind. So if you're going to do a Bible study on, you know, why you should forgive other people, you already have your conclusion right at the beginning. This doesn't do that. This goes, okay, what does this text say? What can I learn from this text or this group of texts? And you investigate it and observe it and bring out your conclusions from your observations and interpretations. So that's what it does. And there's three steps to it. There's the in observation stage, the interpretation stage, and the application stage. Each of those build on top of one another and help you study the Bible in a inductive way. And I want to help you do that. This is a channel dedicated to helping you study your Bible. If you like content like this, I encourage you to subscribe to this channel as we learn how to study the Bible better together. So the problem with many different Bible studies is that it can seem very directionless, especially if you're studying the, studying the Bible on your own and you don't have any helps with you. So when we're studying the Bible, it is good to have a method to use that we can apply to not just one text, but all texts. Now it's going to be different each time, but to have an overall strategy and the tactics may change, you're going to be a better student of the Bible. So let's look at the observation stage. Now the way to do this the best is, is to pick out a book of the Bible and divide it up in different chunks or a section of the Bible that's helpful. A section of the Bible that I uh, would choose right now is a couple of them. You can choose a section, a couple of verses from Ephesians chapter 4. You could choose uh, you could choose uh, Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes there in the first couple of verses. You could study uh, a particular psalm like Psalm uh, 23, uh, Psalm 22, Psalm 19, and those different ones and just to lay it out there for you to see. Isaiah chapter uh, 6 verses 1 through 8 is another good one to look at. But take one of those and if you have a Bible you're comfortable marking in, do that or copy and paste it from a Bible uh, software program into a plain text document or a, a Word document and get it there so you can mark it up. Now, here comes the good part. To observe the text, you have to use these different methods and moves to get yourself to observe it well. And each of these are kind of like a tactic or a jig that helps you bring things out of the text better. You don't have to use them if you're used to doing it. You don't always have to use these different jigs or tactics, but they help you begin to read better. The problem with the ancient texts is they wrote in a different way that we write today. Today, if you look at the different authors, like popular authors, so for instance, if you read something by uh, Tim Ferriss or some uh, religious writer that's writing today, they are going to take an idea and just spread that idea out over a vast paragraph because that's just how we write. We take a long time to get to the thing that we're trying to say. Many times in the ancient world, especially the books of the Bible, they will take uh, no amount of time to say what they're trying to say. And so there's a lot of text, there's, there's a thickness to scripture that is always going to be there, even if it's a verbose passage. Like Psalm 119, you know, the biggest chapter uh, in the Bible, the biggest psalm in the book of Psalms, um, does repeat itself and does really does say the same thing over and over again. It probably doesn't say it in, in unique ways. So there is exceptions here. But most of the time, especially the narrative sections, they're written so tight that if you're not careful, you're going to fly off the trail and you're not going to be following it very well. So you got to slow down. And a way we can slow down when we read is to read it out loud. It may be uncomfortable for us to read out loud or we may not like to, but reading it out loud does indeed help. And doing it a number of times, reading it out loud a number of times or glancing over it a number of times. And a way that I've enjoyed as well is reading it in different translations and re using a audio Bible to let it read to you the section you're trying to learn. If you do that over and over again, what it's going to do is hopefully you'll begin to notice patterns. We are very good at recognizing patterns. That's what we do as humans is very well. And so you're going to begin to realize that there are certain patterns in the text. When you do that, you're going to have your Word document or you're going to have your piece of paper or your Bible. You can mark up in your Bible. I am 100% behind that. And as you're doing that, you're going to notice ideas. You're going to, it's just, if you're curious, have a posture of curiosity. When you, when you do that, you kind of, some ideas are going to come out there. You know, you're going to notice that, um, uh, Abraham is mentioned a certain way or something. 
what you're going to find is you're going to find different keywords being mentioned over and over again. And you're going to see that, man, this text is being very redundant here. So like an example of this is if you look at the book of Genesis uh, after the flood, uh, God over and over again is saying, I'm establishing my covenant. And the word covenant is used many times in that section. You're going to go, huh, that's funny. That's a word that's being used a lot here. Notice that. Write that down. Uh, circle those sections where it says uh, covenant over and over again. Or you'll notice if you're looking at the Beatitudes, this word blessed or blessed, depending on how you read that, is mentioned over and over again at the beginning of each of these Beatitudes. Huh. That's observe that. Note that. It may not be something, but at least you can note it down. And that's where you also have to adapt this posture of just write all your crazy ideas down write all the things that you observe you may find that under this particular rock there's some nice gold there but under this particular rock there's nothing there but be open to observing whatever you can find you're going to get better at this the more you do it but you know work, work on that another helpful thing to do is to look at the different uh, poetics of the scripture now poetics is like uh, linguistics is to language is literature is to poetics or poetics is to literature and these are, you know, how a sentence has verbs and nouns and clauses and uh, grammar and all of that. Well, stories do the same thing. They have their own uh, syntax of language and we could call those poetics. So they are like, you know, characters and themes and ideas and uh, motifs and um, foreshadowing. All of those things help us understand a story. And if you can get those out, then you can better understand the story, which is helpful. Now we move on to the interpretation section. This is where you're going to ask yourself some questions about the text again as jigs to pull out those big ideas of the text. So a question to ask is, what is this text doing here in this section? Another question you want to ask is, what is this text doing? showing or teaching its immediate audience. When it comes to what this text is doing in this section, sometimes it seems like the Bible is like throwing different chapters that don't really mean anything together. But we have to assume that in the Bible, these are master storytellers who are crafting their texts in exquisite ways that we have to follow them and believe that it's not them who don't know what they're doing. It's us who don't understand what they're trying to tell us. So something like in the book of Genesis, right in the middle of the Joseph story, we have this odd story about Judah and Tamar. That's like, what is this doing here? Well, it's it's there for something. And, and reading it with reading the chapters before and after helps us understand uh, what's happening with that particular story. So asking those questions helps us interpret the text. Part of the Bible is written primarily to an audience that uh, could be a person or could be a, a group of people, that sort of thing. So, you know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, they're all telling the story of Jesus and his life and his death and his resurrection. And they themselves have their own unique uh, way of telling a story. We get different things out of each of them. And noticing that helps us understand why things are the way they are. So, for instance, the Gospel of Mark will transliterate many passages in the Aramaic. So, like in Mark's Gospel, we get Eloi, Eloi, Mama Sabachthani, when he's on the cross, or Talitha Kumi, to the little girl. We get those in Mark's Gospel. But the other Gospels simply just say, and he said, arise and come. Because Mark's got a different audience, and Mark's a different person writing himself. So that's going to help us interpret what's being said here. Another question we want to ask, and there's a lot of different questions. I'm not going to list them all here. But another question you want to ask to help with in your interpretation is, how does this text relate to the big themes of the Bible? Themes like God's faithfulness, the story of creation or recreation or salvation or the coming Messiah. The Bible is about this one giant big story. In each of its sub-stories, or it's even plots or episodes, relate to that big idea. And those big ideas have to do with God's faithfulness, uh, the coming Messiah, salvation, creation, recreation. All of those things are wrapped up, really, in the Messiah, which is like the big story behind it all. And so every time we read a small story, we go, okay, this somehow relates to that big story. And that's going to help our interpretation of the text because an interpretation, we may say, well, it looks like so-and-so is the hero of this particular story. We might find out a little bit later that that so-and-so we thought was a hero was actually 
kind of a scoundrel, you know, and it's being God's the hero of the story as he is throughout all of the scripture. So those interpretation questions are very, very helpful to look at. Uh, another one to look at is um, an interpretation is how do other passages of the Bible comment on it? So like the story of Rahab and the spies is quoted by James in the book of James. And so, okay, there you go. Let's figure out what they have to say about it. Or a large story in the New Testament that's looked back a couple of times is Abraham believing God and it, him, and it being credited to him as righteousness in Genesis chapter 15. So if you're reading Genesis chapter 15, you go, okay, why do Paul and others use this passage here? And, uh, that helps us understand and interpret what this passage actually means. And there's a lot to look at when it comes to interpretation. And what really helps interpretation is finding those questions to ask the text that help us get to what's underneath what's just being said. Because what's being said is true and it's and it's the word of God, but in it, we find the meaning inside it. Uh, and that's how we do it. We do it a lot of times through questions or realizing those connections. And a lot of times we're doing this without even thinking about it or knowing that we're doing that in our mind. And so writing it down helps us slow it down and, and work our work out here. So writing those questions down and even answering them helps it. The last section we look at is the section of application. Application is what everybody likes. People love to know, okay, what is it that I have to do? And what is it that I have to believe? Uh, and those are good. Those are good things to, it's good to know and believe. To make good application though, we can't just jump and say, well, here's what this text means I should do. What we have to do is build up a solid observation base. Move from the observation to the interpretation. And then finally, from those interpretations, we can make those specific applications. Because if you read and listen to authors and preachers and such, they will sometimes make a really good point. But that's not what the text says. Uh, th there's got to be some uh, some name for that where somebody makes a good biblical point, but that is not what the text says. And I have probably have done that in my own sermons or my own Bible classes, but it just happens. And we can't do that because that's not what the text says. It may be a true idea, but that's not what it means. So uh, we have to respect the word of God in that way that we are making those proper uh, interpretations. Now, finally, in the application point, there are just three general ways to make this application. One, we change the way that we think about something. So uh, we learn more about God's faithfulness and we can understand more of that. Or we learn about something else and we understand more of that. That is that is application. Don't slight that because those thoughts we have, those beliefs that we have, do affect the way that we do things. So that's helpful in and of itself is learning more. That's a, That's a valid application. Secondly, it would change the way we feel or we change our affections about certain things. So for instance, we may know that um, sin is wrong. We may, through a particular passage, realize its ugliness. So a good application is realizing the ugliness of something, you know, the ugliness of idolatry or the beauty, recognizing and feeling the beauty of the blood of Christ washing away our sins. Those change our affections. And that's a valid and good way of applying the text. The, the most common one we like to think of many times is with our hands is with our hands, is how did this, what should I do differently? And this is, uh, can be very dangerous getting to this point because we want the executive summary of Bible studies. That's why we read books on particular books of the Bible and commentaries and such. And some commentaries are not executive summaries at all. They're exhaustive, but some commentaries just digest the bullet points of what this passage is about. We read those and think, oh, okay, I've basically read it, you know, but we can't use cliff notes to read the Bible. That's uh, wrong and, and it's not going to work for us in the long run because we're not actually learning the Bible. We're learning what somebody else said about the Bible. He may be true. She may be true, but still it's not going to work uh, because we're being dependent on somebody else. And what we want to be dependent on is the word of God, not other things. They're good tools, but don't uh, abuse them. All right. Finally, we move on to this last section. This is not part of the OAI or it's not part of the inductive study, but it's the last part of it that you need to have for it to work well. You need to record what you're writing down or what you're studying or memorize it so that way you can have it later. This is done by a number of ways. And one of the ways that I like to do it is to write out as if you're writing a journal to somebody else and you've studied a particular passage and you might say, dear so-and-so, today I read this passage 
And this passage is about, and just fill in the blank of that. And then write, this passage shows, and then write in the blank of that. And that's going to be like the interpretation of the passage. Therefore, Christians should, and that should be the application section of what you're writing about. So those three things. This passage is about, this passage shows, therefore, Christians should. Because that should is that ought of application, that ought of how to act morally and righteously before God. And then write that little document. And then you can say, well, here's my notes on whatever passage. Doing that helps us better um, write a note for future reference because what I've done, you know, I've you know gone to college, had plenty of courses on different Bible studies, uh, different books of the Bible and different topics. And I have this list of all these things. And I think, uh, I wish I would have wrote more here. I wish I would have wrote this down better because I think this is a good point that I was trying to make, or I, I wish it was more clear because I'm missing some connections. Doing that process of writing as if you're writing to somebody else helps us write something down better than if we would otherwise. Because just like when you were learning math and your teacher said, show your work, um, if you don't show your work when studying the Bible, you're not going to really remember why you made the conclusions that you did. So that's a good method to use. Thank you so much for watching this video. Uh, I've got more videos like it uh, on my channel, so be sure to subscribe, like this, and tell me um, what, how do you record your notes when you're studying the Bible? What sort of system that you have developed? Because that's something I've been developing or working on more so. Uh, some of the videos on this channel is jumping into that as well. And so thank you so much for watching this and I'll see you guys in the next video.